The M25, yes. For, for our American friends, <laughs> why, why are we giggling about the M25? So there's a famous motorway in the UK. It's the orbital motorway that goes around London, and it's most famous for um, generally being stationary rather than moving. Anyway, I was decided I was going to do a Messier object because we're slowly working our way through the Messier catalogue and I haven't done one in a while. And so I just thought I'd pick one at random, and I thought, oh, M25. So I picked M25 pretty much at random, not actually knowing what M25 was at the point where I picked it, but on the basis of the fact that it's this orbital motorway. So do you just get excited by it because it's got orbital in its name? <laughs> no, I've just spent rather too much of my life sitting on it. To Yes, I know it extremely well, as most people in the UK do. Having Anyone who's ever had to circumnavigate London knows about it. You do see good pictures of the M25 from space. Uh, you sort of it's an impressive piece of motorway, it really is. And it, you know, in my lifetime, I used to live in London, and in my lifetime there, it kind of came into existence and did change getting around London quite significantly. M25, Messier 25, is as with many Messier objects, and this is the danger of picking one at random, it's a not very interesting looking star cluster. I love star clusters. Well, they're quite pretty, but yeah, so here's a picture of it. It's nice. It is quite a pretty star cluster. So, Professor, is that an open cluster? It is indeed an open cluster because it's not globular, as in round. Um, so that means it sort of resides it's fairly close to the plane of the Milky Way and it formed relatively recently. Actually, I don't want to talk about the cluster because we've talked about lots of clusters. And we have to say something about it. Well, it was found in the, the 18th century. For some reason, it was missed in the new general catalogue when Herschel was cataloguing clusters. Uh, but did make its way into a thing called the index catalogue, which was where how they kind of uh, rounded up all the objects that have been missed in the new general catalogue. So this uh, one's got a Messier number, but not an NGC number? It has no NGC number, it has an IC number instead, so it's in this thing called the index catalogue, which is kind of the leftovers from the NGC, things that were missed in the NGC. But I don't want to talk about this, I want to talk about that star there. I think it pretty much probably is the brightest one in the cluster. It is actually one of the members of the cluster, it's not just the foreground star. It has a name, it's called U Sagittarii. And the U means it's a variable star. So when they were naming variable stars, the brightest, or the first one that was found in any given constellation was called R, and then they went S, T, U. So it's one of the first variable stars that was found in this particular constellation. Um, and it happens to be in this cluster of stars. So it's a Cepheid variable star. Uh, again, we've talked about Cepheid variable stars before. They're a kind of pulsating star. They're quite useful because, remember, one of the things that we always try to figure out with clusters is how far away they are and we have various sort of tools we can use that we can kind of calibrate against each other. One is looking at the, these, that colour magnitude diagram, seeing where that main sequence lies and moving it up and down to figure out how far away the cluster has to be. One is using the period luminosity relation for these Cepheid variable stars and, and using that to figure out how far away they are. But it turns out there is a, in some sense, the, the kind of gold standard way of measuring the distance to something, which is an absolute distance measurement that you can do to Cepheid variable stars like this, and indeed somebody has done to this particular Cepheid variable star. And in astronomy, measuring absolutes is really very hard to do. It's usually, if you've got two things that are the same brightness, and one appears much fainter than the other, you can say that one's further away than that one, but that's a relative measurement. You need to know, in order to figure out how far away something is in absolute terms, if you're using how bright it appears to be, you need to know its absolute luminosity. Typically, that's not something we know. And similarly, if you, you know, if you have a, like a standard ruler, something of a specific size, you can say, well, something which appears smaller is further away, but unless you know the absolute size of that ruler, you can't say absolutely how far away it is. So there's a very famous case of this, which, again, anyone who's ever watched Father Ted will know, which is that there was a, a famous case, so there's a very dim cleric in this particular show and a fairly smart cleric, and one's trying to explain to the other, and he has a model cow in his hand and there's a cow out in the field, and he's trying to explain to this, his very dim friend by saying, small, far away. Okay, and so that's the classic problem in astronomy that we have, that we don't like, when you see something small, you don't know if it's intrinsically small or if it's just on the other side of a field, right, or on the other side of the universe in our case. So relative distance is fairly easy, absolute distance is very hard to do. One of the things we can measure in astronomy is the colours of things, and which doesn't depend on how far away they are, because something which is green is still green if you move it further away, it's just a rather fainter green thing. Um, and so we can measure the colours of things, and colours translate very directly into temperatures. They tell us how hot the star is. And there's a very simple law that called Stefan's law, which says that when you know the temperature of something, you know how much light it gives out per unit area. Okay, so basically the hotter something is, the more light it gives out per unit area. So if you measure the colour of a star, and hence its temperature, then actually if you knew the radius of the star, and hence what the surface area of the star was, you could just say, okay, so this star is this colour, so it's this temperature, so it's giving this much out per unit area, its surface area is this much, therefore it's this bright. Its intrinsic luminosity is this much. Professor, if you don't know how far away the star is, because this is the problem we're trying to solve, 
how can you possibly know the radius of the star? Therein lies the problem. Generally, you don't know the radius of the star. So that's where this really rather clever technique comes in for kind of inferring the radius of a star. It's a thing called the bader Veslink method. The way this works is this type of star is a variable star. The reason why it's a variable star is because it's pulsating. And you can tell it's pulsating because if you measure its light over time, the light output varies over time. Sometimes it's brighter, sometimes it's fainter. But the other way you can actually tell it's pulsating is you can actually see, if you look at the spectra of it, then you can look at the lines in the spectra and use that to figure out the speed of the star, this Doppler effect thing. And, and essentially you can measure the Doppler effect as, you, as this thing goes through its pulsations and you can see that sometimes its front side is coming towards you and sometimes it's going away from you. So you can actually directly measure the fact that the star is kind of increasing in size and decreasing in size. On the scale of the galaxy, that seems like it would be such a tiny amount. It is, but fortunately we can measure speeds very accurately through this Doppler effect. So actually you can measure you know, a, a really sort of a kilometre per second, which in astronomical terms is rather a low speed expansion really rather easily. Um, and so you can actually you can directly see the star expanding and contracting. The other neat thing is that at any given time, by measuring this Doppler shift, you know how fast it's expanding. So if you sort of multiply how fast it's moving by the time that it's moving at that speed for, you can know how much it's expanded by. So although we didn't know how big the star was to start with, by following this Doppler effect over time, we can see in absolute terms that it's grown by this much in, you know, in meters. So not that it's 10% it's bigger, but actually that it's grown by however many million meters, how many thousands of kilometers. Now, if you think about it, as the star grows, let's pretend that the color, the temperature doesn't change at the star. Unfortunately, there are other complications that that changes too, but let's keep life simple and say, okay, so if the temperature doesn't change, as the star expands and gets bigger, obviously it's now got more surface area, so actually it's going to give out more light. And in fact, if we follow its expansion, so the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, that means if the radius changes by a factor of 2, then the amount of brightness of the star changes by a factor of four because it goes as the radius squared. So if we follow the expansion of this thing and see when it's ex when the light out when the the apparent brightness of it has changed by a factor of four, that means it was twi it's now twice the size it was when it started. And we know how much it's expanded by. So we know actually in we now know how big it was to start with. It's like saying um, if I were 1.8 meters taller, I'd be twice my current height. Well, I haven't actually told you what, my, what height I actually am, but actually that's enough information to tell you that I must be 1.8 metres tall now, because that's what I require to double my height. So we can do exactly that measurement. We can say this thing is doubled in radius, and we know it's increased in size by this Doppler measurement but by this much. Therefore, the radius it was to start with must be this much. And that then allows us to go back to the original thing of saying, OK, so now we can multiply the amount of light coming out per unit area by the surface area of the thing, because we now know the surface area, because we now know the radius in absolute terms. And that gives us an absolute measurement of how, how, what the luminosity of the star is. As I said, there are sort of complications, because as it expands, the temperature probably changes, as it expands and contracts. But actually, we know how much the, the, that will have changed the luminosity of the star, again, from the same Stefan's law, so we can factor that in. There's one other complication, which is, of course, I said, you know, you measure its expansion and contraction by the Doppler shift. You think about it, some bits of the star are coming towards you, but actually there's bits at the side you can also see which aren't coming towards you. They're pulsating this way. And so you have to put in some sort of fudge factor in the calculation to say, actually, you know, the expansion you see isn't just the line of sight motion. There's other stuff going on as well. So there's, there's, there's sort of complicating factors, but, but physically it's actually a remarkably simple, straightforward way of make, making a direct measure of the radius of a star and hence the distance to it. If the whole star is moving away from you, then that's just a constant speed. And then on, superimposed on that, sometimes you'll see it a bit, you know, expanded, going away from you a bit less quickly, other times a bit more quickly, just because of the superimposed on it are the, the pulsations of the star. It's actually one of the reasons why we know that this star is almost certainly a member of the cluster, is because it is indeed moving away from us, and it's moving away from us at the same speed as all the stars in that cluster are moving away from us, so they're all moving together, which gives you an indication that it really is probably actually physically associated with the cluster. It's been a little bit superseded, because probably the simplest way to measure the distance to a star is another thing we made a video about in the past, is this thing called parallax. That, that, you know, when you look at your finger up in front of your face, sometimes it, you know, and, and blink one eye, then the other, your finger seems to move because your perspective from the two eyes changes. We can do the same thing in astronomy, that you take a picture of a star, you then wait six months to be around the other side of the sun, and because you're looking at the star from a slightly different direction, if it's relatively nearby, it'll move 
relative to things in the, in the far distance. We've now got very good at measuring parallax um, through various satellite missions like Hipparchus that was in the past, and now there's Gaia up there at the moment doing the same thing, which is actually measuring absolute distances. That's an absolute distance measurement as well. And actually, because we now can measure parallaxes to very great distances, that's probably superseded a lot of these methods. But historically, this was the way that the cosmic distance scale, the, the figuring out the scale of the whole universe was kind of anchored to some absolute measurement was by techniques like this. Reason that, reason, places that stars form are rich in gas, rich in dust, and it's these gassy, dusty regions that the infrared light, in this case observed with a very large telescope in Chile, allows us to kind of see the stars much clearer, 